into it. I uh, had a high school rock band. We started playing in coffee shops in the 90s. We had a manager and, you know, he owned an accordion. He just basically handed me an accordion and said, figure this out. I learned to play piano originally and then I took up trumpet. Um, and so accordion came to me in high school because of this high school rock band. And uh, yeah, it was just, it was an employment opportunity. We started playing coffee shops. They're like, no more roads, no more vintage keys. That stuff's too big. And we went acoustic, which was kind of the trend back then. Coffee shops were kind of new in the 90s, and so we were hitting the scene, as it were, playing acoustic, you know, rock and coffee shops. So what was the first song that you learned to play on the piano and also on the accordion? On the piano, I was classically trained, you know, Clementi, Bach, Mozart, you know. But the accordion, it was all the repertoire we were working on in that band, which was a lot of originals, a lot of Bob Marley, a lot of uh, Bob Dylan. <laughs> you know, it was kind of all over the, all over the map. We wow. Played some great too. And how did you meet Miss Susie Williams and um, begin to perform with her? Well, we've been kind of uh, swimming in the same circles in LA here uh, for a number of years. She used to come to the shows I used to do at Casa Del Mar with Leftover Cuties. And, uh, yeah, one thing led to another, and I kind of throughout the pandemic we started playing together. And actually, with Steve Weisberg, I, I would uh, back her up in that band. I was with Steve Weisberg for a while, and she would be a guest to both of us. So we were always connected. Childhood memory playing music. I think one of my favorite memories was uh, in high school when my high school rock band, the one that introduced me to the accordion, played at the uh, Topanga Canyon Reggae Fest at the Will Gear. Theatricum Botanicum. That was like the pinnacle of our band. We had we hired a horn section. I wrote all the parts for the horn section. And it was a really great performance. And then sadly, the band kind of fizzled out after that. Botanicals is where they perform Shakespeare. Is that correct? It is. But they did do this cool little reggae fest. Okay, so you you, you were uh, uh, ah wonderful. So you guys did a reggae fest in the Shakespeare Theater. Yes. Amphitheater. Uh huh. Wow, that's super cool. All as a musician, two different styles. I think jazz is kind of a through line, and knowing how to speak jazz uh, allows you to speak in other sort of musical styles. Wow. Without appropriating it necessarily. I can an example of, um, of, a, of a jazz riff that you could sort of give us. And ska, and ska was kind of very influenced um, by that's all I wanted jazz. To be working on it, so so there, you know, it's because all, of that all the music that we listened to, I think, kind of came from jazz. So, it came from Jamaica, you know, or, just, you know wherever. You know, High life in Africa. I mean, it's, there was jazz influence in all over like. the place. Okay. I just think I, I like what, what Brad everything kind of right, that's came from the same point, essentially. Sure, I it's evolution. Wow, that's lovely. I love. Thank you for explaining. Jazz to be like urban folk music. 
you know, classical like, music, which is basically put music in front of a musician and they can read it, and it's all sort of finite. You know, it's it's what's on the page and how you interpret it. And, and folk music is the other tradition where it's like passed down and it's didactic. And jazz kind of skirts because you know there's very advanced jazz and great composers in jazz and great written music in jazz. But um, what's taught to jazz musicians is how to sort of react to music when it's happening and to lose their ears. And rock and roll, and you know, you wouldn't be. The Rolling Stones just don't just sit there and read music off the, <laughs> the music stands. Influential jazz uh, musicians. Yeah, I loved Gil Scott Heron. I got to oh. see him quite a few times. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cool. Uh, he, he's great. He's very influential. Um, what is his sound? Well, um, he's kind of like, like the father of hip hop. I mean, he was a spoken word poet. Um, you know. Um, yeah, Hugh Masekela, African trumpet player, uh, also a great vocalist. Did you say tr tr Trumpet player. Trumpet. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. He, he was an influence. There's um, a trumpet player right here behind yeah, you. Yeah, that's right. I don't know if that's a theatrical picture, but... I don't know it's either, but him. it's really interesting. <laughs> yeah, I another do. jazz trumpet player. Um, so, Sun Ra. Sun Ra so these was, are you know, all jazz reggae? No, not really no. reggae artists, but I, I'm more of a jazz guy. Like that's, that's that's the music I truly buzz on. Let's get going. Um, but like I said, it, it has open doors to so many other styles. Lovely. What about reggae? Could you give us one of your favorite oh, reggae artists? Jimmy Cliff. Ooh, I love Jimmy Cliff. I love the song that goes, um, they're waiting for you up in the sky with apple pie. Uh -huh. Wait. So, I can't think of it right now. Okay. Next question, if I may. Um, if you could think of three words to describe music, how music makes you feel. Music is a very um, expressive art form, so it can make you feel a lot of ways, to be honest. You feel relaxed and excited, depending on the vibe. I mean, it can make you feel a whole range of emotions, so it's, making it makes me excited. Excellent word. Miss Susie Williams has joined us. Excited? Of <laughs> oh, you look <laughs> I thought that was you a good choice of like, words, I mean, right? Miles Davis, our Wayne Shorter, wrote a song called ESP. Oh, you know? Wayne Shorter! Oh yeah, my God! Yeah, he passed away recently. I mean, oh, ESP I just kind of explains music how how Shorter. this other kind of sensory perception can uh, bond musicians while they're making it together. Mm -hmm. It is kind of a sixth sense in a way. Yeah. So that's that's kind of <laughs> talking about this. You know, I think onomatopoeia po poetry, onomatopoetic poetic is an onomatopoetic poetic word. Onomatopoeia. Yeah. I've never heard of this guy. Is smart. Onomatopoeia. Yes. That's onomatopoeia. And what does it exactly mean? It's it's a you know describes making up sounds that describe. I think Yiddish actually has quite a bit of that in its language. You know, in the language of Yiddish or the dying language of Yiddish. You know, all of those words are so expressive. They sound like what they mean. You know, do you have a word that you like or three words that uh, well, I, have I just love what Mike just said but yes. I'll just sorry. say I'll just say I'm bafo sorry, wait, wait, I love the word bafo bafo what bafo bafo, bafo means like um you know a, a, a success a, 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 a you know a bafo box office uh, extravaganza what language is that in it's english it's just uh, probably a word used in how the 40s more often how do you spell it B O F F O. Uh, excuse me. When you guys come out of the curtain, would you make sure? Before we go, could you yeah. tell us if you could be a superhero? What would you be and why? Ah, superhero. Well, um, yeah, that's a good question. You know, I, I'm very into urban planning. You know, I think uh, it's not really being a superhero, but uh, only because I play on the street quite a bit, and I'm very aware of like how a city's environment affects your ability to play on the street, because if you can play on the street somewhere, it means the city is a true city. Um, so, yeah, maybe I'd come back as an urban planner. <laughs> Thank you so much, Thank you, Mr. Michael Walter. We really enjoyed meeting you. We're going to see you play. Everybody, please go to radiovenice.tv for their live stream.